Good morning and welcome to The Rock. The title of my message is The Sheltering of God. The word shelter, when I looked up the definition of it, it's a state of protection and safety from hurt. Strongly protected place intended to be safe. The word shelter is used a number of times in Scripture, but not only as the word shelter, fortress, protection, refuge. They are all under the heading of shelter. God is our shelter. In Isaiah 25, verse 4, and I'll read from the NIV translation, under a heading that says, Praise to the Lord. Praise to the Lord. Verse 1, O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you and praise your name. For in perfect faithfulness, you have done marvelous things. Things planned long ago. Verse 4. You have been a refuge to the poor, a refuge for the needy in distress, a shelter from the storm, and a shade from the heat. For the breath of the ruthless is like a storm driving against a wall, and like the heat of the desert. But a shelter is used in that verse, a shelter in the storm. As we, yes, move through this pandemic and begin to think of the impact and, yes, the effect that it has had on many, many people, many people are actually asking, and I've been one of them, what is going to happen now? Some are predicting the worst. The world will never be the same. They say, we'll never get back to normal. I was brought up with the saying, never say never. Never say never. The pessimism about the impact of this pandemic is almost as bad as the pandemic itself. So, what does one say to those who predict such a dire post-pandemic life? Well, I'm certainly not a prophet, so I cannot tell you all that God is going to do. With this time of sheltering, we must understand Whatever we are going through, see it as a time of sheltering. And I'll do some explanation. But I can tell you what God has done during and after times of sheltering in the past. Let me start, however, just briefly to review the truth of history that we find in God's word. And once you and I review this history in God's word, I truly believe that you and I will know what God is going to do in this time. In this time. In the book of Genesis, of course, we know the story about the creation. God created man, woman in his image, blessed them, multiply. We read further on, but in Genesis chapter 6, about the wickedness and the judgment of man. I'm reading from chapter 6, verse 5. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent and thoughts of his heart was not, well, sorry, was only evil continually. And the Lord, this is a most interesting line. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and yet he blessed them. But now he was sorry. 
and he was grieved in his heart. God was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. I've created both, sorry, both man and beast, creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I've made them. God was sorry that he had made man who had he created in his own image. Yes, we know sin came in. And then this verse, but, these ifs and buts in scripture, but Noah found favor. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. It goes on to say, this is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generation. Noah walked with God. Noah walked with God. Verse 22 of chapter 6, it says, Noah did according to all that God had commanded him. So he did. And again, it says, then the great flood in chapter 7, it starts. Then the Lord said to Noah, listen carefully. Then the Lord said to Noah, come into the ark and all your household, because I've seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Notice what the Lord said. The Lord didn't say go into the ark. He said, come into the ark. And so God was inviting Noah into the ark, into his very presence. God was inviting Noah. God was in that ark, in that ark. And of course, Noah went in, and we know the story of the flood. Verse 16 of chapter 7 of Genesis. So those that entered male and female, all flesh, went in as God had commanded him, Noah, and the Lord shut him in. Notice who shut Noah, his wife, and family, and all of creation in. The Lord shut him in. God sheltered Noah and his family for nearly a year in that ark. I've been a year in lockdown, but I've been able to get out the door and breathe fresh air. Noah was locked in for a year in that ark with all these animals and these creatures. It's just beyond one's imagination. If you watch, I know Clive enjoys these animal programs. I do that as well. When you see these large animals and uh, the sort of mess that they create, uh, all in the ark for a year. But God blessed them after the flood receded. Chapter 9, verse 1, So God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Kept in that ark for a year, then released, God blessed, and he said, multiply. There's a number of stories in scripture about God preparing people, sheltering them. God sheltered Joseph, and we know the story of Joseph from his 17th year to his 30th year, 13 years, God sheltered Joseph. But it took part in slavery and, of course, prison. But those two places became the school where God prepared Joseph for greatness. God sheltered Elijah by the brook of Cherith. And after the sheltering, Elijah stood alone against the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. God sheltered Daniel, a young boy, for 70 years in Babylon. 70 years. While Daniel wrote his Old Testament book outlining the future of God's dealings with God's people. God sheltered Esther while in the palace of the Persian king. 
and she saved the lives of her people from destruction. We must never misunderstand what the situation is when God is using it to shelter us. I know I complained about not being able to go here, there, and everywhere. But for me, as I put this together, it's been a personal sheltering for a number of reasons. I've had to work through them. But God's been sheltering me in the situation that I found myself in. And he's sheltering each and every one of you. I want to tell you. I want to tell you. I don't know all the details, of course, about what God is going to do. But what I do know is what he has done. Scripture tells us that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if he did it yesterday, he'll do it today, he'll do it forever. And so when we know that, not only up here, in here, trusting God, when we know that, you see, we can say that God, who sheltered his people in biblical days, won't stop now. He will not stop now. We are saved by grace through faith. An excellent message last week about grace and grace and grace. You and I can count on God sheltering us, no matter, in fact, where we've been, where we are going, and what we are going to go through. God wants actually to move us. He wants to move us out of times of trouble with grace. And, of course, at times, unexplainable hope. I cannot explain at times how God has moved or changed the situation that I found myself in, but I do know he changed it. How do we do that? Well, I must share with you again, personally. Personally, I've come through, like a number of you here, many, I would call them temperamental seasons throughout my life, my 70 plus plus. I've seen wars begin and end. I've witnessed religious persecutions. They've broke out in totalitarian regimes. And they've broken out with such speed. Of course, I was amongst those who listened to the news, yes, each night, breathless with tension during the Cuban Missile Crisis at the height of the Cold War. I've lived through the entire HIV AIDS epidemic which began in the 1980s. And I can still remember that morning switching on the television and watching helplessly as the United Airlines Flight 175 crashed into the South Tower of the World Trade Center, the 11th of September, 2001. Those are just some of the things that I've experienced during my life. But I cannot say I've seen anything quite like this coronavirus pandemic that is currently squeezing every nation in its quick and deadly grasp at times. At the time of preparing this message, more than 119 million people have been diagnosed with COVID-19. More than 2,600,000 people have died from COVID-19. And because of the speed of this virus, more than half the people on the planet are in lockdown. They're in lockdown under government-mandated instructions not to leave their homes for any non-essential activity. The world has been locked down. To make matters worse, and we've experienced it as the body of Christ, to make matters worse, the virus's rapid spread has isolated people from the communities that they typically turn to, and that is the church, the body of Christ. There's times of tension and fear. Churches have been forced to close their doors. Restaurants, movie theaters, Many retail stores are virtually out of operation, lockdown. 
I want us to understand this as the sheltering of God. The lockdown as the sheltering of God. How can I say that? Well, right down in my heart, right down in my heart, weighing down, yes, my mind and my heart, are the same questions that are burdening many people all over the world. Why is all this happening? Do I have what it takes to get my family through this? Will everything ever get back to normal? Or perhaps the most pressing question of all, where is God in the midst of these difficult times? Such questions are in fact not unique to the coronavirus, nor are they limited to global pandemics. These are the questions that we all grapple with when disaster falls on us, especially when disaster strikes seemingly without warning. Frankly, I don't know the answer to those first three questions that I've shared. No one can say why the virus is here. There's all sorts of theories. Thankfully, I do know the answer to that final question, and it brings me peace when all the other answers fail. Where is God during this difficult time He's right here. He's right here. The same place he's always been, always will be. God himself said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. We can find refuge from the threat of any disaster. Yes, including this coronavirus. When we turn to God and seek his presence. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Righteousness, peace and joy, the kingdom of God in the Holy Spirit. Righteousness comes through faith. It's all here for us. God is with us. God is equipping and empowering us with everything we need to endure. Not only this disaster but any situation or circumstance that we may face. I'm going to share with you from a, a very well-known psalm, Psalm 121. I know people have said that they've used it and quoted it at school. Psalm 121. As we know, most of the psalms are written by David, a man who is well acquainted with trials and tragedies. But even so, David could still write these words in Psalm 18, verse 2, and I'm just going to quote the verse. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge. There it is, refuge, shelter. My shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Life often catches us short, and it can be said, and is often very embarrassing, to find ourselves needing help as a man running a family. Often it's a very challenging thing to say that you need help. Perhaps the Scots are worse, but to ask for help. But sometimes life catches us short and especially in times of crisis. But we all have, as believers, the grace of God. My grace is sufficient for you. Sufficient, sufficient, sufficient. As we read Psalm 121, and I'm going to read it from the New King James Version. It's eight verses. I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence comes my help? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve 
your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forever more. It's a beautiful song. It encourages us to trust the Lord. Yes, the writer goes out and he looks at the mountains. I will lift up my eyes to the hills. God created those hills. David would have seen them. He went out. I lift my eyes to the hills. God's creation. And then he says, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He created those mountains, those hills, those trees, those flowers. That's one thing we must never, ever forget when we enjoy the creation of God. He created them for us to enjoy them, and we can see the amazing, amazing skill of God's creation. I've been looking at little creatures recently, and I call them beasties, and I look at them with intense interest to look at how God created them. Penny and I were away for a couple of days up at Natal Spa, and sitting on the veranda, I looked at the table, and there was a beastie moving along the top of the table. I couldn't believe the size of it, first of all. It was a little beastie, about the size of my small fingernail. I had to get my super cell phone, and take a photograph of it. It was a praying mantis, totally created in all forms. As you see the big ones, this was a little praying mantis. God created that, God's creation. And that's what David is saying. I look at the hills, God's creation, but God is my helper. You see, the psalmist lifts his eyes and sees the one, in fact, who is not only our destination or David's destination, but he's also our strength for this journey of life. We can trust God. The psalmist assures us that God is there for us. What I found very interesting was that when he wrote, I will lift my eyes up into the hills, David's writing, personal, I. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. That's just verse 1 and 2. And then he includes us, the readers of the psalm. He will not allow your, 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 my foot. He who keeps you will neither slumber nor sleep. He enlarges the actual trusting in God. The Bible never lies to us about claiming life is easy. Christianity is no free pass. There are no shortcuts to bypass the essential human experiences of life, the essential human experiences of life. We need to go through them. That's growing up. What are these possibilities then of help for us on our journey? Well, first and foremost, we can look around for help because the psalmist says, Look at the hills. And then he says, the Lord is my helper. My help comes from the Lord. God is not merely the creator of all things. He is the sustainer of all things. Paul writes in Colossians 1.16, By him all things were created. Paul then goes on to say in verse 17, He is before all things, and in him all things consist. They continue in God. Then comes the promise of help on the journey. The writer perspective changes, as I said, from I to you. The psalmist tells us that the Lord perceives you. The Lord protects you. The Lord preserves you. When the, when the present begins to feel treacherous, we can lift our eyes above the situation. Yes, even above the beautiful works of God's creation. Cast our eyes beyond even that into the face of our heavenly Father. We know He loves us. He watches over us. In fact, over this entire journey 
of life. And life is a journey. Life is a journey. I remember being told by my English teacher to read a book called Pilgrim's Progress. Wonderful Christian book. Pilgrim's Progress. We are pilgrims on a journey. Pilgrim's Progress. Moving forward. You see, no matter what the future holds, no matter what may lie around the next corner, our help comes from the Lord who loves us. Nothing can keep us from His love. Parkinson's disease can't do it. Cancer can't do it. In fact, coronavirus doesn't even come close. Because no matter what it is that you and I are facing, whichever way our road bends, and there's going to be bends in the road, read the signs. That's one thing. We used to have good road signs on our roads when you came through a pass and there was a thing like an S. If you didn't adhere to that sign, you had a problem. I want to tell you. They were windy, windy, windy roads. Adhere to the signs. The signs are in this word. It's an instruction manual. Read the instructions. So no matter what we're facing, Yes, even the roads bending, whatever obstacle looms ahead of us on our road, we can say, as Paul said in Romans 8, verse 38 and 39, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present nor things to come, nor height nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.